Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know where, where this is going really. That's interesting. So yes, when they moved, um, when they moved it, the, like the Chinese American community, I believe was very supportive of that. Mm. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I honestly don't have opinion one way or the other. What you say makes sense to me, right? It makes sense that they moved it, but, um, it seemed to me from the reaction that I've gotten from the Chinese American community is that they were supportive of it. They thought they were like applauding, like good job, you know? Yeah. 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 I get that. I got that a lot actually. Um, like the, these in my comments and everywhere, because it seemed like, yeah, a, a certain hypocrisy has ended. Like finally you, you, you follow through, but then is following through really a smart move in the middle East? Because I mean, China not following through on anything and just making empty words uh, has been going pretty well for them so far. So like, why didn't the U.S. continue just, you know, with the empty word with rhetorics of, yeah, yeah, okay, you get the, the capital in, this, in Jerusalem, but no, we're not ready to move for, maybe we can't get a U-Haul, you know? <laughs> I suppose you can get a U-Haul. It's just an excuse, but it's diplomacy. You know, you, you, if, I, if I don't want to come to your place because I don't like your, I don't know, your, your mom. I don't have to say I don't like your mom. I can say I'm sick. And you know I'm lying. And, and everybody knows I'm lying. But I don't have to say this thing. Right? I mean, it's diplomacy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that you say that. Um, because Americans are very straightforward in the way they do things. And even if it rubs people the wrong way, um, I, I feel like that's just how they go about it. And when I talk to my Chinese colleagues about this issue, they also mention that, that they notice that Americans, when they do diplomacy, it's very straightforward versus how the Chinese do diplomacy, where you don't really know where their motives lie, right? Is it? Is that, it? That's, that was their opinion. <laughs> so. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know how diplomats from different countries compare. However, um, just looking at how the, the rap, the, how, what is it called? Rapprochement? The reapproachment of uh, the, the U.S. under Nixon with Kissinger and uh, the People's Republic of China happened. That was total two-faced diplomacy. Sending Kissinger on secret missions while at the same time being anti-communist and then going there and being like, we are now with these guys, as opposed to with the USSR. Those are bad communists, but we are now with these guys. They're not really, I don't know, maybe they're not communists or they're good communists or whatever. It was diplomacy. So I, I, I really didn't see them ride in there uh, on, a, on a cowboy horse and being like, you know, screw you guys, we're Americans. No, it was this, this, the same diplomacy game that everybody plays where you go like I can't publicly admit that I want to do business with you but I want to do business with you so how about publicly I say some bad stuff and then wink wink we meet somewhere and maybe we even establish relations and we kick out Taiwan from the security from from the UN I mean it's it's so crass in a way right so you're so basically what you're saying is America does the same thing it's just we're better at it we're better at uh keeping it low key right sometimes yes sometimes no i mean george w bush wasn't exactly low key yeah no uh, yeah um uh, this uh, obama's sand uh, line in the sand remember the red line that wasn't low key that was just kind of like giving yourself this 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 weak spot where you go like if you do this i got i will respond why would you do that Right? Why would you? Why would you give? Why would you put yourself in a situation where you have to respond because you you said so? You can still choose to respond, but no. Now you're in a, in this in this. You you have created a condition for yourself. Nobody else did it. That wasn't really uh, smart. Uh, Donald Trump wasn't very smart from the beginning to the end. So sometimes Americans are. I guess American diplomacy is uh, effective. Sometimes it's not very effective. Right. Depends on leadership. And I think the same goes for the Chinese. I think now Chinese diplomacy is at a low point because Xi Jinping is just dominating the whole thing. The, the, the top meritocratic uh, uh, level of, of advisors, I don't know if he listens to them at all, but I mean, blowing stuff like the CAI with uh, Europe, that's a fail. That's just a fail.
like you failed the 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 leadership in beijing failed how could you how could you have the eu out of all places not want to do, to do business with you they do they really do if you leave them alone they will sign any sort of treaty it will be detrimental to them it's fine but no you had to you had to be brash and and be rude and and censor uh even meps from the european parliament yeah. what did you think what did you like you, you know they were going to be like okay yeah sure our uh, parliamentary what are they the minute the the meps they can't go into your country anymore but we will sign this paper <laughs> right yeah. Crazy, it's crazy. Yeah. Is Germany yeah. still close to China, or are they moving away in the in the past months? Because I know you said that uh, the first time we spoke, you were saying yeah. that um, Germany's relationship with China is due to America's the vac the vacuum America left behind. But now that America's back, it seems like Germany is still kind of in that same trajectory with China. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure. Um... If I want to uh, say the 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 relationship between Germany and China is entirely uh, dependent on where America stands, I think the relationship between Germany and China is dependent on where the money is. A lot of it is just companies like Volkswagen; they want to make money, and they are very, very, very important for the German uh, for the German economy because it's not just German cars from Volkswagen; it's also all these companies that sell stuff to Volkswagen. Like, if you if you want to make a car, you're gonna have a, a company that makes windows. You're gonna have a company that makes tires. You're gonna have a company that makes just these these seats. And all of these companies kind of hope that the trade with China is not gonna experience any any hiccups. And 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 that's a lot of jobs and a lot of people. And so the German government is kind of looking at them and thinking like, well, on principle, I really don't like human rights violations, but. I kind of also really like these people to have jobs, yeah. and so you kind of go where the where the money is. I think, um, yeah, and 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 we're getting more and more dependent on China, and so it gets more and more difficult to to say anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but right now I don't really see a change, a substantial change. It seems like the the European Union as a whole is moving away from China, but Germany as a an, an individual country is still kind of steadfast. Is still kind of saying like, yeah, let's not, you know, uh, make it make a stink. Let's kind of just do business as usual. Yes, I mean, so the the, the draw to um, Chinese money, right, and the draw yeah. that huge Chinese consumer market is 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 too enticing for businesses to really like stay away from. So for for instance, like I I can't. I can't blame Germany at all for like wanting good trade relationships with China for the best interest of its country. So for instance, right, like, you know how China, um, they banned or no, they put a high tariff on Australian wine. Yeah. So, you know, that's that Australian wine industry took a big hit because of that. And um, now the U S wine uh, industry has, you know, gr like, ticked up exponentially because China started importing wine from America. So, um, you know, even though, you know, America, Australia, and like the EU, we like talk a big game about how we want to like stop China from doing things. At the same time, we also very much do want to do business with China. <laughs> so yeah. you know, there, there's always going to be that kind of paradox and that disconnect, right? Because they have yeah. that huge market. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's a one one fifth of the global population yes it is i wouldn't know how you would get around that market really yeah we've moved ourselves in a position where it's very difficult i think um together we still kind of hold our own uh, uh you know in, in terms of like market weight and everything but individually not so much yeah um, and you can notice these things in, uh, for example, how this was something I'm not really a, a, a football fan, but I remember in the last few years, football fans from Europe complaining that games were being held at times that weren't really good for them because they wanted to show the games in China, you know, because of the time difference, six hours. If you if you play at eight at night, that's 2 a.m. in yeah. Beijing. 
like 8 a.m. 8, 8 at night in uh, Germany is, is uh, 2, 2 a.m. in Beijing. So maybe the, 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 the football league might say, let's, let's play at four. That's better. You know, that way it's 10 in China. It's still okay. I mean, you, they got to stay out for 90 minutes, right? Um, but maybe for the German fans, they're like, why are you playing at four? It's, it used to be eight. Like we come here after work and we have a hot dog and a beer and that's football. It's not like I, what, I got to rush after work or on the weekend, you know, I'm still out picnicking and now I'm in a, in a, in a football stadium. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where the money is. Yeah. I mean, same. I mean, I know this is like a little bit off topic, but yeah, same, same in America where we have a, like, so you're talking about football because I know Europeans are very passionate about football. Um, I'm not as into sports, but as a like parallel analogy, like, you know, what the Chinese uh, government does to movie censorship, for instance, right? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to watch a movie, but I don't want to watch a Ch like the Chinese sponsored or funded movie where the movie is so sterilized and so like clean and devoid of like spirit. Yeah. You know, because of the what the Chinese want, it's like watching something good, and now it's shallow and lost all its meaning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, to be fair, I think a lot of the output of Hollywood wasn't so good to begin with. But um, yeah, like like I don't know. For example, changing the villain, so the villain cannot be Chinese because you know then the the movie can't play in China. It's it's just silly. Like I, I as a German, I don't get it offended at, at a German villain. Right. I'd be like, it's a good match actually. You know, you've got the right German accent. It's nice. You know, if if the villain speaks with a strong German accent, I'm like, yeah, you you got that right. But but for the Chinese government, it, they 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 can't have it. So a lot of the the, the movies just seem weird. Like you you watch them and you're like. Why did you put one Chinese actor in there that nobody has ever heard of outside of China? Well, because you want the Chinese market. Yeah. But then this actor kind of like uh, outside of their, uh, their comfort zone, acting in English now, as opposed to, to ch Chinese, to an audience that doesn't know them, and just being kind of transplanted in there because of this market. And at the same time, the bad guys can't be Chinese and it has to be clean. There can't be, I don't know, too many boobs or whatever. Yeah, it's, 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 it's tragic. But it's all like our own digging. You know, we're digging and digging and digging. And then we're like, why am I in a hole? Well, <laughs> we're, it's, right. And it, it feels like the more money the Chinese accumulate, the more issues we're going to have, not with just with the movies, but with Chinese interference in like world affairs, period. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, censoring, there was a thing where, well, yeah, they were censoring these MEPs from the European Union. They were censoring uh, think tank uh, 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 researchers. I mean, it, it, it kind of just gets more and more bold, you know? Like, first you control the domestic environment, and then you go like, well, you can't say that in your parliament. I'm like, excuse me? That's like my parliament you were talking about. If I want to talk trash about you in my parliament, it's still my parliament, you right. know? No, for them, that's, that's not enough. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, I think, in a way, Trump, he, I mean, he was terrible. But I think we talked about this before. In his, in his naive, undiplomatic way, at least it was a wake-up call. Like, first of all, you can't rely on the states. You can't just hide behind the states and be like, yeah, they're going to fix it. No, they might go, th go through some very tough times and get a Trump. And the second thing is, we got to really look at China, what's going on there. We can't just pretend that they're going to change and become a democracy just because we, we, we help them make more and more money. So I think that was a good thing. And the second thing is, looking at Xi Jinping, um, he looks very, very strong, like domestically, very like tough and everything. But he has so many uh, international blunders, you know, like, like getting the, the European Union to... to to cancel the CAI, that's really something. That's quite an achievement, you know? It was, it was smooth sailing, but then he's like, no, fuck you. And we're like, okay, well, then we gotta cancel that. I'm sorry, you know? Wait, well, so, I'm sorry, what was, the, what was the impetus to canceling that? Well, there was, they, they were trying to, um, oh, can you hear that? 
Okay, hold up one second. There's a biker gang or something here. They were trying to kind of, in the European Union, they were trying to kind of get this thing ratified with, without too much attention. Right. Because it wasn't really so nice. Like in, within the CAI, I think one of the things, one of the uh, clauses, if I don't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was that if it's an NGO and it deals with China and it's in Europe, it should have a Chinese head. Mm. So, so it's like, you know, all this kind of stuff is just odd. Right. So, but, but they thought like, yeah, we're just going to kind of ratify it and it's not going to make, make any waves. But then it did make waves because the media environment has changed these think tanks they, they they have become more alert so people are actually talking about it and then some of the these these media and uh, think tankers and also people from the european parliament were talking about like yeah do we really want to have an, a trade agreement with people that are um committing a genocide or at least a cultural genocide in in xinjiang right. which to them being declared persona non grata by China, like you can't come in anymore, you're being censored, which in turn led to the European Parliament going like, what, you're censoring our members now? And if you're doing that, it, there's really no way we can just sign and ratify this, this CAI. Like, we, it's, it's a slap in the face. And after that, we're not going to pretend to, to be friends anymore like that, you know? That's great. That's fantastic news. I'm glad. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I, yeah. I was very worried that they might get kind of, they might pull it off and just kind of ratify it within the time frame of, you know, the thing not making, making any big waves, but it did make big waves. And uh, China just behaved in a very undiplomatic way, which, you know, is a mistake sometimes. And now it looks like the thing got canceled. So I'm happy about it. Yeah, no, same here, because China's have been making huge moves in uh, uh, forming alliances with, like, Asian countries and all these other, like, third world countries, you know, and especially, like, making inro inroads into countries that, like, Europe and United States mm -hmm. ignored, like Africa, right? Yeah, and, or, uh, or the Baltics, or even European countries. Greece, Hungary, they're, they're there. Right. So, Hungary is a problem. And, and I'm sure, like, these countries are very welcoming to the Chinese money because it's Chinese, I mean, it's money, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, but a lot of the times it's not so much money, it's just promises of money, and now they're learning. So in that as well, there is a little bit of a souring of the, like, uh, Montenegro, they built a huge infrastructure project. I don't know what it was, some, some road. And it turned out a disaster, and now they're appealing to the European Union to bail them out to give them the money to give back to the Chinese because they just kind of, they had signed something that didn't make sense with the Chinese uh, promising them, you know, all kinds of good things, but those things never materialized. And now they're kind of in shit. Um, and this is, this is a, a common experience. Yeah. Yes. It's actually very typical. Like as a lawyer, um, when I deal with like Chinese clients, you see it like, you know, the, the issues you're talking about from like the, like a national country perspective and how they have issues with legal, um, meeting their legal obligations and actually drafting and signing meaningful like policy and legislation. I see that with individual Chinese, um, you know, clients as well, where they come to me and they, they sign some legal gibberish right where that doesn't that, that where it shows that they haven't done their due diligence so uh, i'm not surprised that uh <laughs> the chinese have come onto the scene they're major disruptors they want to break things right break things and make things in their own image um but they're not quite uh, sophisticated enough yet right in international dealings if, in my opinion from what i see at least i don't know i mean i think there is a there is a misunderstanding that the Chinese state has and that Chinese people have um, is a misconception of themselves. I, when I was in uh, Central Asia, I was surprised at the good things that had come from China. Actually, like road construction, um, at least it's new, Correct. and at least uh, are you still there? Yeah, it just okay. Sorry. So I was looking at, for example, road construction. And it was pretty good road. Central Asia has a lot of bad roads, uh, Soviet era roads or like later nationally built roads. They're not necessarily very good roads. 
the European Union doesn't come in and build roads. The right. Americans come in and build roads, but the, the Chinese might. And so I was looking at these roads and I was like, this is nice. And people will remember that they're driving on a Chinese road and right. that it's a good, or, or for example, Uzbekistan got a nice train and I was taking that train. It's not a bullet train, but it's a nice, clean, modern train that goes fairly fast and has little like uh, displays and stuff. And it was Chinese, of course. So I was looking at it and I was like, well, here Chinese is, China is actually like doing things that are going to have a positive impact on the population. Like it's good to have that train and it's good to feel like, well, we didn't have to wait for Europe or the States to, to come and be like, here, take the super expensive thing that you can't afford. No, we got something cheap from China, but it works. But the problem is, I think the misconception is that even though they do this kind of stuff and even though often or sometimes it works, people are terrified of them because China is behaving like a like an imperialist country, really like. Uh, it, it is so big. I think, for example, people in Kyrgyzstan, they're very conscious of the fact that their population is, I don't know if it's that of Beijing. You know, the country as a whole is not even Beijing. And then you have this behemoth right there. And the behemoth kind of goes like, well, you know, historically, that part of your country was mine, but, you know, I'm not going to act on it, but just no. And by the way, here's a road. Here's a train and, um, you know, let's, let's, let's do some business and maybe I'll open a, a copper mine. People are terrified. Oh, they sure. are terrified. They, 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 they feel like they have no ways of competing with the Chinese anyway. If, right. Like for Iran, if, if you have an Iranian business and you produce anything, then that idea is going to get copied by the Chinese. They're going to make it cheaper and more and they're going to swamp the market and the, the Iranian business is going to be gone. Right. This is... This is a stereotype. It doesn't happen often, all the time, but it happens so much that Iranian people are like, please, like, just stop letting the Chinese in because it's killing our business. Like, we are being killed by sanctions. We are being killed by our own government. And we're being killed by Chinese employees where we can't compete. People are telling them. I, don't, I, don't really, I really don't think that they know that. I don't think they understand that because they feel like they're victims internationally because of 150 years of... Uh, what is it called? Humiliation. Mm -hmm. But if you're from Kyrgyzstan, you, you don't care about those 150 years. You care about what's now. And if you're from Iran, you don't care. You have your own 150 years of humiliation or how, however long they are. But everybody gets humiliated by, by imperialism at some point. Mm -hmm. And then you look at this behemoth and you're like, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, China is very daunting because, you know, the money factor, um, you know, to me, because they're a, a country that has no religion, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't want to get into religion because I know it's a very like touchy topic, but I think, you know, like their, their, um, their main purpose is to go out and make profit, right? At any cost. Um, so I think there's no like limiting factor to like, you know, ethical, moral limiting factors to mm -hmm. their ambitions to like, world domination and also just very practically speaking making money for like the the chinese you know citizens yeah i'm i'm not so sure if i would say like you you have to ground your moral framework in religion you could be just kantian right you could just say philosophically i have morals you know uh, the the categorical imperative that's how i act and you don't need to be religious for that and i think the Chinese, they have the capacity to do that. It's just that with all the lies and with all the, the, the lived lies, not dead lies, not lies about what happened six years ago, but lies about what's happening right now. Are we socialists? No. But do we say we are? Yes. And, and at the same time, with the, with the experience of all the turmoil and all the trauma that, that happened when you were being kind of ideological, then it's just really better to be super opportunistic, super pragmatic, and just to say like, okay, what's the bottom line here, guys? You know, we're going to do business with the Taliban? Doesn't, it doesn't matter. The, uh, there was an interesting article by, who was that? Was that Chris Buckley or something? Fascinating. The flags for the Islamic State, they were made somewhere in Guangdong. Huh. Yeah, because the Islamic State is like, we want to have black flags with like Islamic State logos, 
we don't have the capacity to make these flags, but we need a bunch of them because we're a state now, right? And we want to terrorize everybody. So please, online order, make me a bunch of flags. And that, that shop is like, oh, okay, I can't read this, but it's a flag. Let's make it. Right. Make a bunch of flags, ship them there. <laughs> and they're like, uh, do, do you know what this is being used for? Don't care. Don't care. It could, it could be a rainbow flag. You're right. It doesn't matter. And that's so typical of the Chinese attitude. They're just like, we don't care what your the, like what the ends, you know, what your purpose is. We we're just here to make the money. And I honestly, I I, I can appreciate that about you know about the Chinese people because they're coming. They're from coming from a third world country just a few decades ago, right? Yeah. So I can completely appreciate and understand that the need to, you know, put profit over a lot of things. Yeah. It, that idea might be a little less palpable to like people in the west maybe i'm not sure because like when we were talking about maslow's pyramid of like meeting all your needs and stuff like that i think the chinese have so long been trying to just get the bottom um bottom needs met safe mm -hmm. food, shelter and everything like that so that's why they're like hyper focused on making profit and not really caring about like the morals of it as of yet i don't know if they ever will but like, I mean, this is a hypothetical uh, question, but like, wouldn't you think that other countries have gone through similar trauma, traumas? Like if, if we're to say, for example, Japan or Germany after the Second World War, both of them are morally destroyed and physically destroyed. Germany more so than Japan, but Japan to a certain extent as well. Both are not free anymore. They're, you know, they, they're under somebody else's uh, control. And then what, what can they do? They can, they can fulfill their needs for a decade or two. They just go like work, work, work. Let's buy cars, build a houses and, 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 you know, eat and go on vacation. And after that, there's a reckoning, I think more in Germany as it seems and less in Japan, but there is some sort of civil society and, you know, like uh, um, academia is thriving, media are thriving to a certain extent. That doesn't happen in China, does it? It's like the middle class gets gets fulfilled, they get their needs fulfilled, and then after that, the, the, the next step doesn't really come. It, it does come in individual ways, like there's, there's uh, organic farms, uh, there's people that go back to the countryside because they want to make it better, there's people that advocate for LGBTQ, there's, there's feminists, there's all these individuals that have strong morals or like a true cause and a calling, and it's very beautiful. But on a, on a large scale, it doesn't happen. It's just people saying, well, I got the needs and now I want more. Yes. The same. Yes, yes. And that's, that's a topic that we should discuss one of these days is the overconsumption of like material goods and the chasing of like material goods um, by, by like the Chinese youth. Um, I've been hearing from my Chinese colleagues that that's a huge issue in China right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, to a certain extent, it's the same for us, but not to that level, I guess. Hello, this is Toto. Hi! <laughs> what's, what's his name? Toto is her name. Toto. Hi, Toto. Miss Toto. <laughs> we finally get to see Lale's cat. Yay! <laughs> my, the thing about my cats is they like spanking. <laughs> they just like they, you. <laughs> I don't know why, but my cats, they're, they're into spanking. <laughs> okay uh, well they're very kinky cats <laughs> we like that we like very interesting cats um but i guess you know we pretty much like exhausted this is really mm -hmm. topic for today so if you have any other comments for our viewers before we leave no, no. no. <laughs> yeah i think we pretty much covered all our bases so um join us we're going to be on Clubhouse tomorrow if you have time, right? And we will be discussing that. That'll be tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern. And I'll leave all the details on my Twitter. Um, other than that, awesome conversation. Thank you to our audience. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Lale. Um, Thank you. At our Thunder and Lightning.